<clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's good to be here on June 30th. Uh, wishing you all a safe and healthy upcoming 4th of July weekend. We've all been through a lot together these last few months. And in a way, it's been a great opportunity for the Business Council of Westchester to present the leaders in our, in our political and state and county and federal legislative system. Today, it is our seventh political leadership series that the BCW has held since the coronavirus crisis began. We want to thank all of our sponsors for their continued support. Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, Empire City Casino by MGM Resorts, Levitt First Insurance, Greenberg Turek, Thale Industries, and Verizon. Also like to recognize the chairman of our board, Heidi Davidson from Galvanize Worldwide, and the vice chair of governmental affairs, George Lentz from Nicholas and Lentz. Thank you for your leadership and all that you do. Our priority is to continue to make sure that the Westchester business community has the opportunity to hear from our political leaders on how New York State is handling this crisis and how the state will face the numerous challenges that we will have over the next few months. We are excited that Westchester County has begun the reemergence process. Today, we are in the second week of phase three and looking forward to moving into phase four next week. State government has and will continue to play the critical role in helping New York's reemergence from the pandemic. Today's guest, New York State Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, will, will play that pivotal role over these next few months as every region of the state reopens for business. It is now my pleasure to introduce John Rabbits, BCW's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. John? Thank you, Marcia. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is safe with their families and their employees. As Marcia said, we have made a concerted effort to bring the Westchester business community, the political leaders and state leaders uh, that we felt was important for them to hear from during these last few months. It started with our first uh, event with the county executive and his staff, including the Commissioner of Health, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, uh, Majority Leader Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins. Uh, last week, we had the president of M the MTA and Metro North. And today, we are very fortunate to have uh, one of the key political leaders in New York, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty. Carl Hasty is the uh, 100th Speaker of the New York State Assembly. He has the historic distinction of being the first African-American to be serve as leader of the chamber's 150 members representing communities across the state of New York. Since February 3rd, 2015, he has led the assembly majority in efforts to uplift communities and promote a family's first agenda that prioritizes strategic investments in the health, safety, economic, and social well-being of New York's families. Under the leadership of, the, of him in the assembly, they've won a number of landmark victories that the delivered to the Assembly Majority's promise to expand opportunities for achievement in communities around the state. Speaker Hasty represents the 83rd AD in North uh, East Bronx and was elected to the Assembly for the first time in 2000. And I think it's important to always note that prior to being in the Assembly, Speaker Hasty served as a budget analyst in the New York City Comptroller's Office. He earned a master's degree in business administration with a concentration in finance from Baruch College and a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics and statistics from Stony Brook University. I had the good fortune of serving with the speaker for my final two years in the assembly uh, and we have worked with him in other areas uh, of my career and uh, I've always admired his commitment, his dedication and his ability to uh, understand that it's important to go out throughout the uh, state to listen and to learn. And I, Mr. Speaker, you'll have to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this pandemic will also cause you for the first time not to do your summer tour of all the uh, members in the district in every region. But that shows your commitment, not only to your members, but to their constituents. So thank you for being with us. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, John. Thank you to the, uh, the Business Council of Westchester for having me. Um, 
Thank you, John. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Marsha. Um, I think uh, when uh, the uh, ball dropped in uh, Times Square on uh, uh, New Year's Eve or, or New Year's Day, I don't think any of us had envisioned us being in the position and the place where we are uh, today. And uh, today actually puts us halfway through uh, this year. Um, I'm hoping we bottomed out and we're on the, on the upswing. Um, but particularly since this business group and the business organization, and I know uh, Westchester County is in phase three, um, but it's important for us to make sure that uh, we still balance um, the health of, of people while we try to make sure that businesses can open and function uh, because it has a ripple effect. We will make sure that business thrives, so they can keep their employees, so uh, people uh, are not. Um, uh, living on on unemployment, but it's a delicate balance, uh, and I know that there's challenges even in trying to keep this uh, delicate balance. But um, I think um, one of the opening comments that Marsha made was, you know, what's going to happen over the next few months, and I think um, really what's going to happen over the next few months is really more for, uh, you know, what's going to happen in terms of the federal government. Uh, because right now, even in New York State, we're facing an $8 billion budget. Deficit. Um, and uh, all localities, Westchester County included, New York City, uh, are also going to see uh, a loss of revenue. One, because people haven't been working, uh, people aren't going shopping, so there's sales tax uh, revenue uh, by, uh, declination. So these are the challenges that we, you know, we are, are facing. Um, I've had many, many conversations with our federal representatives about the importance of, uh, one, providing uh, necessary resources to help businesses, uh, which was done in two of the stimulus packages, and, and also on a continuing basis. So I think that's kind of the, the state of where we are uh, today, um, uh, trying to live in basically a virtual world. We even had to change the rules of the assembly where now uh, we don't necessarily have to be on the floor. We have to have some, some people to be present. Uh, and I feel as captain of the ship, anytime that we're in the session, I should be in Albany. Um, but this is kind of, uh, I'd say where the world is right now. I think until um, there's either, uh, um, I'd say a vaccination for this COVID virus or it runs its course or we get herd immunity, any of those things, I think that um, we're probably gonna be living in this type of world for the foreseeable future. So with John, I'll, um, I'll, I'll open it up and I'll take questions, um, comments that people wanna have. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's, let's stick to the state finances because uh, you know, you, you've raised obviously one of the key issues that you and your colleagues are going to have to face in Albany. Uh, especially if Washington uh, does not uh, uh, give, get a new relief bill in place soon. Last week, Comptroller DiNapoli uh, issued a report saying that New York tax receipts for May were down 19.7% uh, to the prior year. And as you mentioned, we're facing and looking at an $8.2 billion uh, a deficit. Uh, and obviously, the concern is if Washington doesn't act, that there will the governor under the new bill, and maybe you can go into that a little bit that was passed during the budget, he and his budget director can do some reforecasting uh, and, and implement eight cuts if need be. Um, I'm curious to talk, think about what are some of the alternatives uh, that uh, you and your colleagues are looking at. Uh, there was a report last week that members of both majorities, not all, but members of both majorities are looking for tax increases uh, for the top revenues in the, in the state. But are there other ideas that you're thinking about to, uh, besides just raising taxes, that A, might uh, help in terms of the relief and also prevent some cuts to a local government? Well, that's a, a, a large question there, John and Jack. So um, in the event that the, well, let me go back to you asked about the, the budget. So in the, in the state budget, um, we passed, we had an, an expected uh, assistance from the federal government. And if that does not happen uh, uh, quarterly, the governor can uh, 
readjust uh, the budget. But then the legislature has 10 days to respond. The governor puts out a plan, we can respond uh, concurrently. Uh, the assembly and senate would have to agree with the uh, uh, together uh, to uh, to change the the, uh, the proposed cuts. Um, the governor's preliminarily said that if we don't get any revenue um, from the federal government, uh, that there will be 20% cuts across the board. Uh, and, Basically, in education and in healthcare and, you know, and uh, um, aid to locality. So these would be devastating cuts, um, you know, across the board. And so, um, as a, a person who has a finance degree, when you don't have enough money, you have two choices: you either have to um, cut spending or you have to raise revenue. And the level of cuts that would have to happen. I do think that uh, legislature, and I believe even the governor at some point will have to look uh, at revenue raises because these cuts are just, these will be cuts that we've never seen. We can go back to the, um, the recession of 2008 and 2009, but these cuts would be maybe two or three times the size of the cuts that happened even during that time if we only choose to fill the budget gap by cut. So, uh, John, to answer your question, I think at this point, everything you know, would be on the table. Um, I don't want to negotiate, but I think you know, all revenue raises uh, would probably be on the table. Um, would probably try to look for some uh, savings where you can um, in, in terms of uh, you know, the overall budget. But I do think revenue raises would become uh, a prominent uh, item on the table. And can you explain, just going back to it, because again, it was extraordinary times when you actually passed the budget in April, because it was just a, the first few weeks of when the pandemic had really hit, uh, and you had to do this hybrid type of a legislative session. The governor and the budget director now have different types of responsibilities, uh, but you also, as a legislature, can, can weigh in on that as well, correct? Right. So again, so the governor can, pro can propose, and if the legislature takes no action, then the governor's uh, proposal would uh, take effect. But we would have 10 days to, find or to give an alternative plan in terms of uh, what would happen uh, in, you know, in the budget. So um, uh, we gave the governor uh, some uh, authority to do that, but also it's always important to make sure that there's legislative uh, check on, on gubernatorial powers. And we feel we did that 10 day uh, response, particularly now, uh, since uh, we don't have to gather a person, um, you know, we can have a virtual meeting uh, and come with a response. But I do think that it would probably be more collaborative because like I said, if there's no uh, federal assistance and uh, you know, the house passed the HEROES Act and I've been in constant communication with uh, Senator Schumer. He is hopeful that something will happen, um, uh, you know, relatively soon in the next couple of weeks. But I think we will know, I'd say, by the middle of July where we stand. Well, just for so you know, Mr. Speaker, the Business Council of Westchester, along with our other uh, organizations around the state, uh, have sent a letter to, the, to our congressional delegation and to uh, Leader McConnell uh, stating that this has to happen uh, and there has to be a bill that includes aid to local governments as well as some language on liability because I think every sector uh, that we're hearing from from our members are concerned about liability protection for their employees as well as for themselves so we'll continue to push that and we'll also continue to share with you and your staff some recommendations that we gave in the beginning of the session on ways that hopefully you can look as you're thinking outside of the box to uh, to uh, reduce mandates and regulations that might also give, generate more revenue. So we look forward to working with you on that. I wanna shift to something else that's also been very important and also obviously has, uh, every life has been affected by what's happened over the last few weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, you brought your members back and Senator Stewart Cousins brought her members back uh, to have a session to pass a package of police reform bills. And you know, one of the key factors of recruiting and retaining businesses uh, in New York State is making the case that New York is a safe place to live and work. Can you give us some insight into those bills uh, that were passed two weeks ago? And what's the message that you wanna to send to the business community 
in terms of New York State's criminal justice system? Well, um, John, I might need two hours to answer that answer that question, but let me try to do it as, as, as quick as possible. I think, um, you know, countrywide, not just here in New York State or, or New York City where I live, there has been, um, I'd say, a systematic uh, over-policing in certain communities. Um, you know, the treatment, particularly people of color, has been a little different than, uh, than others, and I'm saying that to be polite. And I think when you saw the murder of George Floyd at the hands of uh, the Minneapolis police, I think it struck a nerve uh, around, not even just in the, in the city of Minneapolis, but, um, but in the, the country and in, in New York State and then also around the world. And I think what people have been asking for, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say people are against, you know, all police. I think we're just against bad policing. And I think what some of the laws actually did was that it just gave a little transparency. You know, other um, you know, municipal workers' uh, records uh, are foilable. The only one, only uh, employees whose records weren't foilable were the uh, were police, fire, correction, I think parole or probation. I don't remember off the top of my head. And so basically what the repeal of 58 did is put the, uh, those uh, municipal workers in the same category as all other workers. They were given an exclusion in 1976. People feel quite often that that was able to shield bad police officers' uh, records. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes some officers have had, uh, you know, uh, dozens of, of uh, complaints, and, and I'm talking particularly here in the city of New York. They ought to be uh, put in the records, but uh, people finding out what those uh, records were uh, were not open to FOIA. So that's one of the bills we made, uh, the chokehold um, the felony that, you know, unless it's self-defense, uh, someone's, you know, uh, uh, at the point that it's, uh, you know, resisting arrest where the officer may feel that they are in danger, uh, a chokehold just to bring someone into um, compliance uh, is when that, and if you um, obstruct their breathing and uh, have serious physical injury, uh, an officer could be faced with a C felony. That would be the same charge um, if if you or I uh, were charged with, uh, with with strangulation. So, police officers not being treated any differently than any individual would be in using uh, a chokehold. Uh, we also have the special prosecutor. Um, the attorney general will now investigate all crime, or all uh, instances, excuse me, where uh, someone dies at the hands of uh, law enforcement. And, and then there's also a unit, a new unit to be created, created with inside of the attorney general's office where people can lodge complaints, of misconduct, corruption, and the like. Uh, in the attorney general's office, we also did uh, the STAT Act, which um, keeps track of how many uh, really low level violations are, are being done at the hands of the police because again, um, uh, statistics do show community of color are quite often more uh, overly policed. So John, you asked me, what is the message that, um, uh, and there were other bills, there was a package of 10 bills, but I would say those were, you know, those are really, I would say the, uh, the highlights of the, of the package, but the message that I think that uh, the assembly, uh, you know, wants um, uh, people to understand is, you know, no one wants a lawless society, uh, but I think people want uh, a fair and just system. They want fair and just police uh, to treat all people uh, the same. I think uh, they want people want to see a system where it really doesn't matter what color your skin is um, uh, when there's an interaction with the police. I think people are also, as well, uh, when, you know, when they people are saying defund the police, uh, you know, as the Speaker of the Assembly, I take that as more of a message of people want to see more social spending so that there's less interactions, uh, you know, with the police, uh, that we need more, more services for people so that the result isn't um, 
uh, I'd say a contentious interaction with the police department. And I would say, I think overall that's what, okay. So I wouldn't, uh, to the business community, I would say this, uh, this is really the, about just trying to make sure that there's transparency and fairness in the, uh, in the criminal justice system. So in New York State, when we talk about, I mean, the issue of defunding police is now a national conversation. But if I'm hearing your, your, you correctly, it's more reallocating funds to assist in community affairs and, and, and raising quality of life in the communities, which at the end of the day, hopefully helps our police officers as well. Right. You know, there's, there's certain instances, you know, when I look at the, um, you know, it was in the 1980s, um, I believe when uh, Elmer Bumpus was killed in uh, in the Bronx, uh, uh, this was a woman. She had uh, so, you know some mental illness. You know she's a 75 year old woman, um, and you know and she was shot and killed. Clearly, you know a, a better situation might have been if there was a social worker there on hand. You know she didn't have a gun. She was just holding a knife. Um, so I think those type of you know uh, interventions may be better may be better served if, uh, you know, someone who's, you know, certified in, in, in dealing with somebody who's having um, some, uh, some, those type of issues, I think is a better way to go than having the police uh, react in, in, that, in that situation. And I also think people want to see more money being spent on our youth and our youth services. Uh, there was contentiousness on whether we would have the summer youth program this summer. So I think those are the things that people want to see. They want to see a reallocation as, and then what I've said is a reshuffling of the deck of priorities of how government spends their money. Uh, they'd rather spend money on the front end uh, so you don't have to have any interaction with police than always having to spend money on the back end uh, in the criminal justice system when it, it, it costs uh, um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to have someone incarcerated. And it would be great if we could take th those resources and uh, put it more towards educating people than incarcerating people. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For, for those of you who are listening, uh, if we do have time, we will take questions. So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, again, we're, we're on a time frame, so if we can get to them, we will. Um, I want to shift gears now to something else, which has been a priority for us at the Business Council. Uh, Westchester's energy landscape will be dramatically changing, you know, with Indian Point closing its last reactor at the end of the year. And the BCW has always supported the use of renewable energy as the future source of how we power New York State. But we're concerned. We're concerned that renewable, the renewable energy infrastructure, especially with the delays that have probably happened over these last four months, will not be in place by January of 2021 to ensure that Westchester County and the downstate region uh, has the power that is needed. Are, is the state beginning to look at, again, different scenarios uh, because uh, not to be overly dramatic, but the clock is ticking. And, uh, you know, Indian Point has made the, the statement that they are closing that last reactor at the end of December. Um, well, John, that's a, that's a critical point. Uh, you know, 25% of uh, New York City's, because this isn't just a Westchester issue, 25% of the uh, power in New York City is, ge is generated by Indian Point. Um, to be honest, you know, we haven't, with everything else that's going on, uh, I have not had any conversations with the with the the governor on what the the plan is, but I will have I will get back to you on this because now it seems like there's been a three month delay in everything. It seems the you know the calendar has been, has been an extra three months has been added to everything because of the inactivity that we've been able to have over the last three months. Um, but I don't know what the exact plan is, but it is an important point uh, not only for Westchester but as I said for New York City as well because of the amount of uh, power that Indian uh, point, um, point. So I will get a response back to you and you can share that with the, uh, with the members of the, the council. And we'll continue to work with Assemblyman Cusick, who is your chair of the Energy Committee, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Senator Parker, who's the chair of the Senate Energy Committee on, again, some of our concerns and again, hopefully some helpful recommendations. Uh, what do you expect to be the legislator's position on rent relief? if we don't receive further assistance from the federal government? Um, you know, when we, we did the, uh, we tried to come up with a, a, a rent relief package that we did and the governor signed it to help people. Um, I, I think the, 
the only way that you can have rent relief is you have to have mortgage relief uh, because it's very difficult, uh, particularly, you know, my district is uh, represented by uh, one, you know, mostly one, two and three family homes. And sometimes that uh, homeowner, you know, relies on the rental income from the, the person to make the mortgage. As a matter of fact, it's part of the application, the revenue from the rental revenue, 75% of it goes towards your application and applying for a mortgage. So I think, um, you know, the banks have, uh, have allowed people, they gave a three month reprieve and said, we'll either let you space out the payments, put it at the end of the mortgage. Um, but I think in order to have a, a, uh, a cancellation of rent, you have to have a cancellation of, of mortgage. And, that, and that's the federal government's, uh, you know, that would be more of the federal government's uh, call. I do think that um, we have to do something for renters who were in distress. That's why we tried to do something uh, for the months of April, May, June, and July, uh, particularly um, since those were the months that uh, people had enhanced unemployment. Um, uh, they did get the stimulus checks, so we just tried to give some cushion that would help the tenants, but would also help the the, the uh, uh, landlords and homeowners uh, to have uh, some revenue. I think a hundred million dollars, you know, back into the economic cycle of tenants and landlords, you know, is helpful. Um, but again, uh, the real relief has to come from the from the federal government. The state doesn't have the resources to uh, in a cancellation of rent to uh, uh, make the uh, mortgage holders whole. I think those two things have to go hand in hand. Thank you. You know, we touched on it at the beginning of, of, of the program, Mr. Speaker. You're the leader of a conference of 104 men and women who represent some of the most rural areas uh, of the state and some of the most urban uh, areas of the state. Um, over the past few months, what have you found as the way to help as, a, as the leader of the conference uh, and what's worked best for you uh, to coordinate a message, to understand the concerns of uh, your members' constituents, and as you mentioned, your constituents as well, because even though you're speaker, you still represent an assembly district, and you have a district office that I'm sure has been working on constituent service. How have you balanced that? Well, I'll say, uh, John, you know, I actually had probably the, the, the assembly district, the number one assembly district in the state with the highest average of, of COVID infection. I think over 40% of my constituents tested positive for the antibodies, which, <clears throat> which means, um, uh, and, and that's because I have a district with a lot of essential workers. I have a lot of home, uh, healthcare workers, a lot of uh, transit workers. Um, so you have to do two things. One, I always have to be the local uh, legislator. You are an assembly member. You know what that's like. Your first responsibility is, is to your constituents. Remember, all politics is local. But you also try to have to balance the, the needs of the state. And I think during this pandemic, the needs of the state has been pretty equalized. I think everybody's had the same issues to deal with, um, but some areas may have had it worse, particularly the downstate region, Westchester, New York City, and Long Island. Um, the effects of the COVID uh, pandemic has been much more severe than other parts of the state, but that doesn't mean other parts of the state didn't have to handle the same problems. Business closings, uh, reopenings, uh, how do you help businesses that had to uh, be shuttered? So I think it's really been more of a common message. It's just uh, the, the severity of each of the, um, the different areas, uh, uh, with the, uh, like when the governor put forward the different uh, stages uh, in regions of when you could have openings. And you just try to listen to uh, uh, members. Um, and if there's a, a need for a certain region, uh, we try to communicate that uh, uh, to the governor. Um, and, uh, you know, on his executive orders, I know some people think uh, we ceded a lot of authority to the governor through executive order. I don't agree with that because any executive order that the governor issues, the legislature could rescind it with the concurrent uh, resolution on many, of the, on many of the executive orders, not all. Uh, there has been constant consultation. Um, but I do think uh, we're just trying, I think the, the state itself, and it shows uh, some of the things that work. There's been certain challenges 
as well as now uh, New York State is one of the lowest in the nation now in terms of infection rate when just a month and a half ago we were uh, you know number one and in, in, in so far ahead in being number one um, and so I think that's really what we've been doing over the last three, you know, three months. Well you, you know you, you raised the point of obviously um, we were faced, New York State was faced with something no one can be prepared for um, and as we've navigated through these first three or four months I'm curious to see again what you think has worked and if we have to and hopefully not but if there is a second wave what are some things that we've learned from that hopefully we can implement uh, uh, throughout the state well I do think um, you know initially when we first were told about the, the, the COVID epidemic um, it was we first thought it was just maybe the flu on steroids and, and it was a new uh, it was a new uh, virus and I think doctors were still trying to figure this out I think governments were still trying to figure out how to handle this it was almost like flying you know in the dark um, uh, with, with no instruments in some regard because uh, even though you know countries in Asia and Europe were a little ahead of us in handling this um, they still were not sure there were still questions on, you know, who was contagious, how long are you contagious, you know, what, what's the criteria for you to no longer be contagious. So I do think in the second wave, those questions might be a little better answered. But if there is going to be a second wave, um, I think how we track, how we isolate, and how we monitor people who are infected, I think has to, um, that could probably, um, be a little better than I think you know happened the first uh, time around. It took a long time before there was a, a decision that said, you know what, maybe everybody should wear a mask, uh, not so necessarily to protect you from getting it, but it was really more about giving it. But I think uh, it's about getting it and giving it. Um, and so I do think that those things are going to have to be looked at. You know, what do you do with a person? who has been, uh, you know, reinfected, I mean, not reinfected, if there's a, a second wave of infections, um, you know, how do we deal with tracking them, who they've come in contact with, and how do we keep them isolated in a safe manner so that it, it doesn't uh, uh, spread um, in an environment when, when people are in close proximity to each other? We've gotten some uh, questions, uh, Mr. Speaker, from, uh, as you know, we represent all the colleges uh, in Westchester County, and we're so proud of them. But obviously, uh, as we've talked about throughout the course of this morning, so much depends on relief from the feds. Um, but colleges are going to have to make some decisions. Um, again, if the feds uh, do not come through, uh, what kind of relief do you hope to be able to help uh, the institutions of higher learning throughout the state? Well, as I said before, John, I think, you know, by the middle of this month, we'll kind of have an idea of whether the cavalry is coming or not in terms of the federal government. And then I think we really have to uh, first look to close uh, this budget uh, deficit, which is about eight, a uh, little more than $8 billion. And then I think we have to see, you know, depending on what, how much revenue can be raised and how much savings you can get, though, then, what uh, we could do in terms of higher education and, and things like that, I think uh, you know th that would have to be, be looked at, but it really would all depend on how much revenue um, we're able to get. Um, uh, maybe the federal government doesn't give us all that we want, but they give us some of what we want. So it really, the, the answer to all of these questions will really have to come at a different time, because uh, I don't want to say that there's a certain game plan and you know and use a football analogy i don't want to come up with a game plan and i don't even know who the opponent is at this point i think we have to look and see uh what the financial situation is based on the federal government i, I do think and, I, and let me just tell you why i am hopeful um uh you know mitch mcconnell said that you know why should he help out blue states even though blue states are give us states we give blue states give more money in, in taxes than we get in return but i do think the fact that Republican states and Republican governors are asking for assistance. And now that you see uh, the, the surge in uh, um, COVID-19 cases are now happening, unfortunately, 
in in some red states may uh, you know push uh, some of the Republican senators to say uh, this is not over and the federal government still has to do its job to protect all 50 states, not just blue states or red states or purple states. And shifting gears, but staying in education, because we've gotten some questions from uh, employee, employers and employees who, again, have kids who are in either uh, elementary school, lower school, uh, or high school, and there's a big still unknown about what's going to happen. And if kids are not able to go back to school on a full-time basis, that has an impact on uh, employees being able to get to work. Uh, what are your hearing, what are your insights, what are you thinking about what's going to happen with the New York uh, school system for our young kids? I think the, the, the uh, desire is to have children back into the classroom and, and that allows parents to go back to work. I know parents and uh, being uh, in the house with their children all day every day has probably been uh, a joy. <laughs> and, but you know, if it's not safe uh, to do so, then we again are going to have to come up with another means uh, to do that. I, I do think, um, as I said, since uh, this uh, COVID-19 doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon, I do think it's probably still best if employers can operate and still allow the employees to work from home. That's probably still best. The, the less congregating that you have of people, uh, the, 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 the less likely uh, that you increase the uh, statistical chances of, of spreading uh, you know, COVID-19. So I think we need to continue to do that. Um, but you know, this, the uh, State Board of Regents and I think the local school districts are going to have to figure this out. But if the new wave is, uh, of cases is gonna happen again in, fall, in the fall, um, you know, does it make sense to put the kids in school in September and then you know, three weeks later you know, have to pull them out again because there's an, uh, a second wave of um, you know, COVID-19. So all of these, those things I think have to be taken into consideration uh, when, when we uh, decide uh, you know, how to move forward with the new school year. Mr. Speaker, the last question, I go back to again, something that I, I said when, in the introduction. Uh, what has separated you from what I've seen in my 30 years of Albany experience is the commitment that you've made to travel the state and your summer tours, which I know has been great because you've been able to spend it sometimes with your daughter, uh, taking her along. You've seen New York, you've seen New York at its most productive and you've seen New York deal with a tragedy like we're doing. As one of the key political leaders in the state, wh what's your message to people about New York's resiliency and how we can move forward? Well, John, thank you. You know, one of the, the joys I, I will say of being speaker because, um, you know, the, the, there's a common misnomer upstate where they think people in New York City, we think Westchester County is upstate New York. Yeah, anything north of the Bronx is upstate uh, New York. So I've tried to spend my time um, trying to tell people throughout the state that that's not how we think, that's not how we feel. Um, you know, I care about the people in Buffalo just as much as I care about the people in the Bronx. Uh, and that has really been the message of, of behind my tours that, uh, you know, when I take the band and the staff with me, it's really to hear from the, the, the different parts of the state. I just think that all of us have more in common. We want uh, good education for our kids. We want a safe environment uh, to live. We want to be healthy and have a good health care system. And we want to be able to uh, have a job and, uh, and put food on the table and put a roof over our head for our families. And I think as long as we keep that common goal, it's happening now. There's always going to be regional differences uh, amongst the state. And I've seen that. Uh, I think New York State is probably the most beautiful state in the entire country. Um, and to be honest, there's parts of the state that I probably would not have seen if not for me being the speaker. So I feel very fortunate, uh, fortunate for that. Uh, but that is something that I am missing uh, from, from being able to get around. And I probably will still do some, uh, uh, you know, touring of the state just to check on, you know, different people. I'd say is uh, all encompassing as it's been uh, over my previous years of speaker. But I do think, you know, my presence me just uh, uh, physically showing up in different parts of the state uh, to let people know that the assembly cares about all parts of the state. Um, 
But I do think uh, when you go back to the point of resiliency, um, you know, when I used to look at the map of the entire country and it would have, uh, you know, little red dots all over the place and you just saw this huge red blotch over New York State uh, when we were by and far uh, number one in the number of cases. But it just shows that when uh, the healthcare industry works together with government and it works together with businesses and works together with um, uh, you know, everyday people, we were able to flatten the curve. And that was really the message all along, to flatten the curve. And we flattened the curve to the point now where New York State, in terms of uh, new infections, is on the, the low, is pretty much at the bottom of, um, of the infections in, in terms of the country. So that right there shows me the resiliency of, of New York, uh, where the empire, called the Empire State for a reason. Uh, we are always, I believe, the best. Uh, the best, the brightest, and as you said, the most resilient. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your leadership, and we will continue to work with you. Uh, even uh, there are some issues that we can agree to disagree, but even when we have that disagreement, that conversation continues. And I think that's also very important. So we appreciate you being here. We appreciate the work you and your staff are doing, and uh, the Westchester delegation members uh, of your of your conference as well. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Marsha to close it out. Thank you so much, Speaker. You've always been a partner with us. You've always been there for us in the Westchester business community. And we, and we thank you. We thank you very much for everything that, that you're doing. We know it's been a very, very intense and challenging time. And we, we have great faith in you as, as, our, as, as, a, as a New York leader. So thank you so very much. John Rabbits, I want to thank you. Um, take this opportunity on June 30th um, for, for, for leading this great, robust series of, of our top elected officials and bringing them to our members. To all of you on the call, thank you very much. And I especially want to thank our sponsors, Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, Empire City Casino by MGM Resorts, Levitt First Insurance, Greenberg Turek, Thale Industries and Verizon, we, we will be very, very uh, focused on bringing you very important content during the summer. Uh, we are not taking a summer break. We are continuing and we look forward to seeing all of our members and hearing from you um, continuously. So with that, we wish everyone a happy 4th of July weekend. Please stay safe and stay healthy. And wear a mask. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Everyone stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.